Genesis chapter 3, verse number 17. And it reads, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and how and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. One interpretation of that scripture says, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. We're doing some teaching tonight uh, that I hope and believe that we need to hear today. I took a pause from talking to you about what we're going to be doing with Planted. Even though I've not been here, I just felt the need to do this uh, today and, and struggling to figure out exactly where we need to be. The Lord laid this on my heart and then convinced me uh, that this was the right thing tonight to talk about. So we're going to talk about the questions of suffering, the questions of suffering. Amen? Lord, we're so grateful to be in your presence tonight, God, to be free. We're so thankful, God, for all the many things that you've done. We ask you to bless this tonight, God, all those that are here watching online. We ask you to bless it, anoint it. Let us be receptive of the word tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Before I start tonight, and we will do this before we leave here tonight, I want us to remember again, continue to remember uh, those that are in the Ukraine and uh, the, the uh, people in Russia. Um, I read one report that there's been over 200,000 Russians that have been um, arrested for protesting against the war. And so from what we are hearing from the missionaries on the ground in the Ukraine, um, not, not the Iranians, the Ukrainians. Some will get that. Uh, the, uh, the, the missionaries that are there have been um, very, very uh, forthcoming on some things, and they're saying that, the, that it's, uh, it's, it is getting a little rougher. Uh, they had one family of 12 that were hiding in their basement as the bombings were going off. They got out. Uh, everything is going well so far, but they still need our help. Amen? Uh, and our prayers. Amen. So please remember them, uh, the Russian people that are fighting against this invasion and the Ukrainians that are also there, that, that God will keep his hand upon all of this, and he'll be the one that leads all of this in his time. Oh, suffering. I don't think there's... A person here that has lived that has never had to deal with suffering none of us are strangers to suffering whether it's a, a, a loved one that we've lost uh, a painful diagnosis a conflict at work a broken relationship um, anything similar to that that causes us grief um, trials are not exclusive to just one person. Throughout Scripture, we see numerous accounts of suffering. And as we live life and as we read our Bibles, it becomes unarguably apparent to us that suffering is just a part of living. If you are in existence, then you have tasted or will taste the sweet, sweet bitterness of suffering. And once we find this reality, once we understand that, one of the most critical questions we find ourselves asking then is why? Why do people suffer? Why do people go through things? Uh, worldwide views and religions, uh, they often, often offer their attempts at answers philosophies and things of like pain is just an illusion it's not really real there is no God pain is meaningless pain is out of God's control pain is payback for past deeds in your present or previous life all those answers have something in common they offer no hope in the midst of suffering but God himself offers us a better answer in the midst of suffering 
One man said this. He said, God could have stopped Satan from deceiving, stopped Adam and Eve from being deceived, or even stopped suffering altogether. But yet, he instead, he chose to use suffering to teach men and women the meaning of willing love and genuine obedience and their need for a Savior. It is our very freedom that makes learning this lesson a possibility, the lesson of suffering. God did not make us to be autonomous. He wanted us to serve him freely. He wanted us to serve him lovingly, not at a force or obligation, but God chose that we would love him with all of our heart and all of our mind freely. Tragically, though, in that freedom that God gave us, humanity chose a life apart from God. And that came when we walked away in a solo attempt to live life. That came with the baggage of dreadful consequences. And whenever we sin, we show that we are no different than those that came before us those that were the first ancestors of humanity. God knew that men and women needed to be confronted by truth. That rebellion against God is frivolous. And that's why that God banished them from the tree of life in the midst of the garden. That's why the world no longer works as it was in creation and neither do our bodies because God needed to confront us with truth and like a rebellious child realizing the folly of their choice willingly returning home and appreciating their family all the more we can freely return to God longing for his love I've been accused Rightfully so, of talking way too much about my grandson. I don't apologize. <laughs> Tuesday, he was at the house, and he was not been feeling really good, and so he was playing with Poppy, and uh, he wanted a picture. And, and his, his honey, my wife, said, Keith, don't give him that picture. I'm sorry, but if a grandkid wants something, that's fine, until she says no. And even I, I'm like, sorry, buddy, we're out. So I didn't give it to him. And like a child would do, no. And he hit me right on my hairless head. And he looked at me like, now what are you going to do? And like any good parent, I grabbed his hand and just went, well, you don't hit Poppy. He faced the consequences, but I hit him like a grandfather. If that had been my kid, <laughs> he was faced with the consequences of his actions. And for a brief moment, his little heart was broken. His little lip got puckered. His little tears flowed down his face, and he cried out for his honey because he was faced with the truth of the reality that that is not the actions that you take. God allowed sin to come into this world and all of its horribleness so that we could feel the consequences of our choices and learn to love him all the more as God displays the beauty of his love in a world of evil. The writer C.S. Lewis famously put it this way, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deafened world. God is not the author of evil, but he is sovereign over evil. Therefore, we, as followers of Christ, have a hope that there, one, there will be a day when God will bring all evil to an end. But until then, there will be moments where God has got to just, you can't.
can't do that. When we're going the wrong way and our conscience has not been severed from us, that God will say, no, I've got to remind you. Times that we didn't, can't understand, we'll suffer. We have no explanation of why. But yet God will do things and allow things to happen to us for his own purpose. Some are those sufferings to teach us. Some is just life. Not every suffering is orchestrated by his hand. But there are times when we follow him that God gives us the moment of mercy to try to tell us, and teach us the path to take. He determines to leave things as they are so that through our trials we might cling to the suffering servant as our Savior. Do not allow your disappointments in life, in a fallen world, to persuade you that God is not there. Nor do you allow the voices of suffering to tell you that God does not care. Those are lies. Suffering will do whatever it can to get you to sway from the path that God wants you to be on. But do not allow it to change your will to live for God in the midst of suffering. Rather, let the suffering drive you again and again closer to your Savior. In the midst of your tears, in the midst of your folly, in the midst of your pain, that is not a time to become an island unto yourself. It's a time to fall once again into the bosom of the Savior and allow Him to wrap His arms around you. And in the midst of your suffering, find the love once again. Psalms 119. I know I didn't give you these verses. I apologize. Psalms 119, verse 67, reads this. It says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept thy word. Verse 71 says, It is good for me, good for me, that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. When we come face to face with suffering, whether in our own lives or in the lives of others, we often wonder why those of us who profess to believe in God still suffer. When I came to God, when I came to an altar, when I was baptized, when I was filled, when I filled out a tithe envelope, all the suffering had to come away from me. That's not true. God doesn't love us. What could his purpose be for me in the midst of suffering? And when the Bible addresses the issue of pain and suffering, it does so within the framework that God is good and all-powerful and has an eternal plan to create a people who are His very own, to make them into the image of Him and to bring them safely to glory. He will do whatever it takes to achieve those objectives even if it means permitting temporary sorrows. In the midst of your suffering, you feel like God doesn't care. That's not true. Because it could be that your suffering brings glory to God. And you say, well, how in the world could me going through something bring glory to God? Ask Job. When the enemy says, I'm going to make them suffer, and when I make them suffer, they're going to curse you, and they're going to leave you, and he says, go ahead and try it. And when Job lived for him, it was the glory that was given to God. It was. In the midst of what, well, why me, Lord? Well, you know what? You go back to what, what God said about Job. Have you considered my servant Job? Of all the people he could have called on, it was Job. Bless me, Lord. Multiply me, God. Why, why is this one being blessed, but I'm not being blessed? Give this to me, Lord. If you're willing to ask God for something, you better be willing to go through something with God to get that. If you ain't willing to suffer, 
some loneliness in a pasture somewhere where you've had to face a lion and a bear, when you've had to face some giants and you've had to go through accusations and you've had to go through serving for so many years for the ugly sister before you ever get a chance to taste of the good sister, you better be willing to go through some things, some suffering to get the blessings from God. Don't ask if you ain't willing to suffer because it's in the suffering that God receives glory. will do whatever it takes he sees you going off path he'll do whatever it takes he sees you learning, leaning to a way that's not of his he'll do whatever he takes whatever it takes here are some examples of what suffering can achieve suffering brings commonality most suffering is just the reality of living in a fallen imperfect world we all experience pain sickness and grief Lord I prayed yesterday why am I waking up with my knees and back hurt the righteous and the unrighteous alike see the sun they also feel the rain the righteous and the unrighteous alike live with the effects of suffering well if I had a million dollars I wouldn't be suffering yes you would Suffering also is corrective. A father disciples, disciplines his children for them to know and to do the right thing. God sometimes uses suffering to get us back on the right path when we're going astray. No parent that loves their child allows them to lick their finger and stick it in a light socket just for the amusement of the reaction. Suffering is also constructive. Not only can suffering correct us, but it also can build character within us. Have you ever looked at someone and wondered how did they become so hopeful? How are they so um, understanding with my brokenness? It's likely because they've suffered some things in their life, grown from it, and learned to care for others through it. And again, I go back to suffering is glorifying. God always works through suffering to bring him glory. Even years, decades, generations later, God will bring the suffering to bring him glory. As with the, man, with the blind man in John 9, God can use a life of pain or disappointment to eventually display a miraculous example of his power. We may... Let me stop there and just say this. I'm going to jump ahead of myself, but I, I feel it now. How many of us honestly would honestly say that we would endure suffering if it meant to save our unsaved family? Put me through it, Lord. If it even means taking my last breath, that they may have a chance to live for you. And then talk to me about how God receives glory in suffering. If I have to go through it, that they might have a chance to live. We question why we're going through difficult experiences and difficulties, why we're going through such pain and sorrow. You're going through pain and sorrow while you're sitting on a blue pew, while you have God in your life, while there's still a relationship between you and God. Maybe the suffering that you're going through is to bring glory to God, to bring somebody else to a path that you're on. Why me, Lord? You ought to not say, why me, Lord? You ought to say, thank God it's me, Lord. You've seen enough in me to put me through the suffering that it might make a difference in somebody else's life. Thank you, God. If it saves my unsaved husband, thank you, God. If it brings my wife to church, thank you, God. If it makes a difference in my children, thank you, Lord. For if I'm saved in suffering, I'm okay. Because one day I'll have a new body. If I'm going through times of depression and oppression and I've got my mind that's all messed up, but yet I'm on a path living for God, I'm thankful if it makes a difference to those around me. There comes a time and moment in life where we have the epiphany. That's why I went through that. That's why I went through that. 
it's for this exact moment that I went through the pain and I went through the suffering and I went through the experience and I went through the fear and I went through the despair and I went through the unknown and I walked the darkness and I went through these things for this moment right now and you have the aha moment. Ah, ha, ha, Lord, now I understand. It's all because there was going to come a path that was going to cross with another when there needed to be an exact moment that God could be glorified. He would use me in that example. The truth is, you will suffer in life. And I'm not here tonight to... Uh, bring everybody's mellow down I'm not here tonight to pass out woe is me pills because you will suffer but you will not suffer without hope you can remember God's greater, greatest purpose greater purpose best purpose through suffering the question you and I ultimately need to ask ourselves is not why but will I? Will I believe in God's promises for my life? Will I cling to God's purposes in my life? And will I trust Him? I believe that Paul says it in his own way in his writings. I was shipwrecked, stoned, imprisoned, left for dead. Yet, I paraphrase it, I would do it all over again if it meant to get his purpose to the people. There comes a time in the midst of our, of our suffering that we need to sit back and just trust in God's equation of hope. There are two things that we need to acknowledge about suffering. That it does exist and it does hurt. Don't ever tell somebody who's suffering, oh, that ain't that bad. Because until you've walked in somebody's shoes, until you've wrote their story and lived their life, you don't know how it hurts them. You might be tougher than them. doesn't make you better than them. Affliction is a reality in everybody's life, one time or another. And no two afflictions are the same. Such affliction takes on many forms, not the least of which is mental suffering. When writing to other believers about suffering, Peter recognized that there are many and various ways in which we deal with grief. The specific sorrow that Peter first, uh, Peter's first readers were burdened by was the mental anguish that comes with going through issues, hardships, pain. And Peter was fully aware that there were all kinds of trials that came against our minds, buffeted us, warred with us, fought with us. There were all kinds of trials that crushed our spirit and woke us up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat that seemed to be a weight around our neck because of the gospel. Peter doesn't have to end on a note of hopelessness and despair. Instead, he gives us promises that we can cling to. Peter reminds us that our trials last only a little while. See, right then would have been a good place for somebody to say, Thank you, Jesus. I felt like this suffering came to be the end all of end all. Peter reminds us it's only come for a little while. I've lived with this for a long time. It's only a little while, really, in the reality of eternity. And a little while needs to be understood in the light of eternity. Even a lifetime is a little while compared to forever. Thus, a long period of suffering in this life is still in God's economy and the framework of His plan and purpose for His children. Just a simple sliver of time. Just a little while. That's not saying that suffering will, will, will feel brief. Because it don't feel brief when we're in the midst of it. 
For many, suffering means that a minute can seem like a day. A day can seem like a year. A year can seem like it's never, ever going to end. But we can't, born-again believers. If you're in here tonight and you're not born again, saved by the blood of Christ, being like Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, following God's plan of salvation, then you still can because time is still on your side. And you can have this blessed assurance that we can cling to this promise that our current misery is not our eternal end. Suffering may fill your life today, but one day in the last time, salvation will always trump suffering. I got to say that again for my own self. I may suffer by a lifetime. I may suffer for a while. I may go through it for a long while. But in the last time, salvation will always trump suffering. We can, we can say with confidence that in every moment of suffering, don't you lie on God. You fib on him. We can say with confidence that at every moment of suffering, every doctor's appointment, every argument, every time I watch them walk out the door for the last time, every phone call I got from the police officer, every time I got a letter from the lawyer, every time I'm going through the suffering, God was present. He never leaves my side in the midst of my suffering. Don't be fooled by the silence. Don't be taken back in the quietness of his voice. Sometimes God could say more in silence than he can in the words that he speaks to you. Because in the silence we learn faith. And in faith we learn trust and we find hope that we know that no matter what we go through, God is present. If we look at Saul of Tarsus' conversion, we find Jesus intimately identifying with his people's suffering. And he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? How could our Lord say me when he was in heaven? Because Christ was present with the people suffering. When you suffer, God suffers. He wouldn't be a good father if he didn't. When you see your child fall and scrape their knee, do you sit there and just watch them? No, you don't. You rush over to them, you grab them, you pick them up, you, you make sure that all the rocks are out of the cut and all the dirt's off them. Tell them, stay away from that. Don't do that anymore. You're going to get yourself hurt. But you're there. How many of us remember when we were learning how to ride a bike? Somebody never left our side until we were willing and ready to go, and then you still kept an eye on them. God is always there. When you were in the funeral director's office laying to rest the loved one, God was there. I've been with you. The only way that you got through, you said it to me yourself, was the fact that God was there. When you watched the hurt and the pain in your life that you're going through, and you wondered how in the world, people all around you said, they were just like Job's wife, why don't you just give up? I don't know how you're doing this. I don't know how you're making it. You can look at them and say, because my God has never one time left me through all of this. He's been there with me. God's Spirit is always there guarding us as we walk through the valleys and the shadows of what would take us out of this world and leading us, showing us the direction to that final destination of salvation. He does the same for all of us that know Him. They know Him as more than just a prayer. They know Him as more than, than just somebody else's relationship but they found God for themselves one day 
and the hope that they found is not generated in some man-made idea. It can never be duplicated or taught. It's only something that you can find. That's a relationship with God that brings hope in the midst of suffering. You have in Jesus a high priest who is perfectly able to sympathize with your sufferings. Why would God not call down angels from heaven to take him from the beatings that he took on the path to the cross because he had to feel the sufferings. He went through the ultimate suffering that he one day could bring hope to you. We can look at it this way. God could do it. I can do it because he's with me. And yet if he took himself out of the sufferings and he said, I won't go through that. We're just going to have salvation just given. How could he ever empathize with us in the midst of our sufferings, our trials? He feels what you feel. He knows the heartache and the pain. He knows what you've gone through. What better person to empathize with you? What better person to teach with you and, and to get his hands wrapped around you to love you than somebody that's already felt what you are going through? Sickness, he's been through it. Death, he's been through it. Got the t-shirt, conquered it. Hurts, been there. People leaving him, been there. People cursing him, saying they didn't even know him, no longer friends, he's been there. He's been betrayed. He's lost loved ones. That's why God won't leave you. How do you know, preacher, that God will never leave me? Because he went through what you're going through. And he knows the pain. And he knows the hurt. And he'll be there holding your hand through it. Because he knows that you can't do it on your own. When you're tempted, and you will be, to believe the lies that God has abandoned you, nobody else understands you, nobody has ever walked the path that I'm on, nobody's been where I've been, and going through what I've gone through, you can be confident in this, that there is no throb or throw that our hearts can know, but he feels it above. And you can be confident in this as well, that one day the sorrow will be behind and only glory will lie ahead. I think we need to rejoice in that today. If there's a truth that we can get excited about, it's the fact that salvation always trumps suffering. There will be a day that all will come and fall before God. I'll never walk through a church house. I'll never darken that church house with my body. Well, you can do it on your own or you can do it under the will of God putting you to your knee. But as long as time is still ticking and light still shines in this world, as long as the echoes of the trumpet have not been heard by human ears, Hope still remains in the midst of our suffering. Help me, Lord, right now. Hope still remains in the midst of our suffering. You don't know the report that I got. I know a God that has hope in his hands. You don't know the situation that I'm facing at home. You don't know the God that holds the hope for you. You don't know the suffering that I'm going through in my relationship. I know a God that's a doctor that can mend a broken heart. And as long as there's still time, and as long as the sands of time are still flowing, there is hope. And the church needs to hold on to hope more now than we ever have before. That's the truth where the church should rejoice today. That's the truth that we can hold on to today. That's the truth we can't let go. There is hope. Amen. 
those that will say pastor I just want God to use me you better be careful it might be in the midst of your suffering that God uses you it might be in the midst of your pain that God causes a miracle Oh, legion suffered for a long time. But what glory has come from telling his story. That woman went through all kinds of problems and issues in her life that we don't even know about. And she crawled on her hands and knees just to touch the hem of his garment. But in her suffering, how many have come to the cross? We can go on with story after story after story of how people have been used in the midst of their suffering that God could bring glory to change somebody else's life. Don't you come down upon your suffering. Say, use me in the time like this, God. Use me in the midst of what I'm going through that it might bring glory to your kingdom. Now that fell over like a lead balloon with some of y'all because you don't want to have to go through it. But I'm here to tell you today, God will use it for his good so rejoice with me today rejoice with me today rejoice with me today rejoice with me come on sufferers come on in the midst of suffering people right now those whose hearts are hurting souls, problems come on rejoice with me today this place please that's the praising of somebody who suffered but yet has held on to hope God has brought glory there are story after story of people that have faced things that they should have never had to face in this life Yet God knew the strength that lied within him. Sometimes we're suffered to go through things to reprove us, to correct us. Sometimes we have to lay in the belly of a great fish until we succumb to the will of God. But look what the glory of God did. Don't you deny your suffering as being from hell. But don't you deny that your suffering is from hell. God can use it. Hell may have unleashed its worst on you. God can use it. Because you are more than a conqueror. More than a conqueror. Come on, pastor. It's Wednesday night. Don't get us going like this. It's Wednesday. You are more than a conqueror. You go ahead and cry your tears. You go ahead and weep, but don't you dare let go of hope. God did not bring you to where you're at right now to let you succumb to this and not God get the glory from this. Death, where is thy sting? Where is your victory? I know a God that can. I know a God that will. I know a God that has. And I know a God that ain't done yet. You go ahead. Don't you let your suffering keep your praise quiet. Don't you allow your suffering to get your worship to stay stagnant and stale. But in the midst of your suffering, lift up your heavy hands. Let your weeping eyes look upon the cross. Lift up your hands in the midst of suffering and thank God there's still hope. How many tonight will lay their head on their pillow, close their eyes for the very last time, take their final breath? Have never heard this life changing message. You have to walk the rest of your life with a limp. Be blessed that your name has forever been changed. 
You may suffer with every step that you take, but it's not something that hurts you. It reminds you of the goodness of God. When you should have been taken out, God gave you hope. When you should have been destroyed, God gave you a second chance. Shouldn't be here now. But God loved you. Don't you let the suffering destroy you. Let it propel you into the greatness and the miraculous and the anointing that God has in store for you. He's not done with you yet. There's still hope. Go ahead, somebody. Go ahead, somebody. Go ahead, somebody. Go ahead, mama. Rejoice tonight. That child's coming to God. Go ahead, somebody cry about that marriage. It's going to be fixed. Go ahead, somebody cry about that sickness. God is a healer. There is still hope. Come on, lift up your voice right now. Come on, lift up your voice right now. Praise your name, Lord. Praise your name, Lord. Great is your name. Great is the... Somebody's going to say, Pastor is just saying suffering's not that big a deal. Then you didn't listen to this tonight. Suffering will bring you to the brink if you don't know if you're going to make it or not. Suffering will hurt you more than any other disease could hurt you. Suffering will put you in a place of grief that you don't think that you could ever get out from underneath that blanket of despair. I'm here to tell somebody tonight, suffering is real. But so is the hope that's found in Jesus. And greater is he that is within me. So tonight, I declare hope. Tonight, I declare victory. Tonight, I declare healing. Tonight, I am an overcomer in the name of Jesus. Somebody let your faith loose tonight. Somebody have a shout in your voice tonight of faith. Somebody let it ring tonight. There is hope found in Jesus. Jesus is here right now. Jesus is here right now. Oh, Jesus is here right now. Oh, hope rings eternal. Let the bells of hope ring forth tonight. Let my ears hear it. Let my soul feel it. Let the reverberations of what God can do, let it shake the very core of who I am. Thank you, Jesus.